So welcome again to another episode of our Hmm. We can ask the questions. <laughs> we still don't have another name for it yet. Today, of course, we have Doug Bannerman. Doug is always ready to Hello. delve deeply and to... Not sure if I'm ready. <laughs> ...field all the big questions. So welcome, Doug. Thank and you. Welcome, everybody. Don't forget that you can text in your questions and at various stages there we'll put up the the number to text those to. So Doug gave our message this last week and that's been put on to Facebook and YouTube as our thought of the week. So I'm going to ask Doug, Doug what takeaway message did you want people to get from that message on the weekend? <laughs> when I sit down to write a sermon, uh, I'm usually uh, thinking, what on earth am I going to write? What is fresh and useful, uh, informative and challenging? Um, uh, I, I think I've always had an agenda to want to challenge mm -hmm. uh, to the extent of stirring the pot, um, sometimes without mercy, you might say. Um, the thought that coalesced initially for me was uh, the bread of the Eucharist and uh, reviewing all the stuff that um, I brought up particularly uh, I guess towards the end of that address um, I, I, I would like our understanding <clears throat> of the piece of bread that we receive um, as a sacred object as representing uh, more than Jesus um, as somehow an object uh, or even as a subject uh, encapsulated uh, because um, my thoughts uh, are moving in the direction uh, in the same way that uh, Taya de Chardin thought as I understand it that um, the without wanting to be pantheistic about it but that the whole universe is God um, uh, or if you don't like that, is an expression of the uh, totality that we can appreciate of God. And so within the Eucharist, the bread uh, for me is coming to re represent more than just uh, this historical figure in the past. The realization that, if you like, healing uh, goes far beyond the personal. Um, and I really would like uh, people to take away from this the, the essence of what Walter Brueggemann was talking about when he said, well, uh, we're not just looking at this uh, sacrament of God again as something some, somehow confined, uh, we're looking at the whole gamut of not only what the universe is, and the way the universe is constructed, but, um, uh, but the way our society and our culture operates. So that's why I was very attracted to his words about, uh, uh, you know, the, the economy, the politics, everything is bound up 
in this? One <laughs> of the keywords which you use, which yeah. I think we can link to that, is the keyword belief. And yeah. you said this came from a Greek word which was... Pistis. Pistis, which yeah. was also the name of the Greek goddess of trust, of honesty and good faith. I wonder if we might unpack what belief means in the same sense as the whole universe, politics, environment, everything that you like is encapsulated in the here and now. When I, when I think about the bread, I think about the here and now. And so if I call that the here and now, where we are now, how does belief as you understand it, or what is belief as you understand it, and how does that, how is that encapsulated in the here and now? If somebody says to me, do you believe there is a God, I will say yes. If somebody says to me, do you believe in God, I will say, I don't know, because I don't know what that means. Um, so, but our, our lives are governed by what our beliefs are. That's what we act on unconsciously all the time. What do the Sykes call it? Uh, um, internal organization principles or something like that. Um, so I can say I believe there is a God uh, without having to then uh, prove that God exists, which seems to have been uh, uh, it's strange to me that nowadays uh, people still argue about does God exist or not. The cutting edge of my belief is expanding all the time and ever since I've been thinking seriously about God no, that would take me back to my teens. Um, uh, my belief about God has been expanding and expanding and expanding. But, and I don't expect it will ever stop expanding. So, Doug, this belief that you're talking about encapsulates so much of what we have in society and anything from economics to environment. How does that belief get tested or how does that belief show itself? Oof. Yeah. Well, I don't always succeed, uh, but uh, it manifests in my life in um, oh, this is a curly one, really. Uh, in, in terms of informing me where um, I need to be active in promoting goodness. Uh, which I'm not, I'm not, uh, I'm not an activist, as uh, I never have been, uh, totally introverted, and uh, that sometimes uh, uh, causes me a considerable amount of guilt. Uh, it faces me into uh, where I could do better and into where I do okay by whatever uh, kind of benchmarks that my moral imagination has uh, 
sent for me today. One of the concepts which I did hear you say was that God tests us or God has the ability to test us and I took from that that God is always however we see God but God is providing what we need for today and some of the testing seems to be when we forget that here and now provision and try to push to pull more of it together to build it up to to make sure that we're okay for the future. Do you have any more thoughts on that? I, I must say that what I was referring to was first of all the general the general tenor of God's dealings with the covenant people in the Old Testament and then latterly um, with Jesus dealings with the crowd uh, as described in uh, in uh, both Mark and John at least um, that uh, I mean it was quite explicit in our uh, I, th I think I quoted, I, <laughs> I've lost it now, I think it was in Mark, when, uh, and, and Jesus said this to test them. He, he's going to test somebody. Um, because all they had was one loaf of bread. Yeah, hmm. thank you. Okay, that's in Mark's Gospel. Um, so, uh, I was remarking on that, and... Uh, what that is saying to me is that the beliefs, if you like, of the, the writers of the Old Testament and the New Testament seeing uh, God in those terms. Now... In the, sorry, in the terms of... Well, in, in, the, in the terms of at least one facet of God, mm. uh, so many of them, uh, is uh, to, to test humanity, yeah? Uh, probably test everything. Um, but in terms of suggesting that uh, God intervenes to provide uh, the poorest of the poor. Now, I, I think of uh, street people in Sydney and New York and so on, you know, people who die on the streets for lack of care. Uh, that uh, I don't see God intervening in their lives uh, in terms of any degree of compassion. Uh, and you can then appeal to Paul and say, well, we are the body of Christ, we are the hands and feet, and so on. Uh, that is true. But um, that is also saying that uh, uh, God is not a kind of magical figure in the sky who says abracadabra and lo and behold there's a meal in front of you. It doesn't work that way. Mm. Not in my experience. So um, I mean, We're in very deep waters here <laughs> about belief it is that um, there's a lot of testing involved uh, testing me and uh, when I'm tested I come up short I know that you know, I, my conscience tells me that so there's a sense in which, which that testing occurs but uh, in terms of uh, uh, the compassionate God actually providing someone who is utterly helpless uh, in in whatever regime 
is forcing them into the helpless corner, uh, I don't believe God intervenes at all. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Otherwise, well, what a wonderful world it would be. <laughs> what a wonderful world. <laughs> well, that gets to the end of the questions that I've been given. Okay. And I would just remind everyone, if you hear something, either in these productions or in the weekly message, wherever you hear it, if you'd like to send that question in, then we will try and answer it at some stage anyway. We may have to go back to this at some time in the future. But thank you very much for being with us and we'll see you again next week. Thank you.